and all right, we're live. Let's get going. Hey, everybody. Thanks for watching. I am live with Dan Whitaker. He is a professional golf coach, an elite golf coach out of Manchester, England, or near Manchester, England. And uh, he coaches all different levels of golfer from uh, tour pros all the way to uh, regular golfers and lots of juniors as well. He, uh, real good concentration on making junior golfers like from regular club golfer to like elite level. So Dan, when, when you see the different level of golfer, and uh, most Be Better golfers are people that have been uh, playing golf for a long time, and they're looking for that thing to make them not just like a little sharper or, or play like, like maybe like a stroke or two better, but they're looking like to level up and to be like another level of golfer. So when you've seen your students that have made really good changes. It might be like a junior golfer that all of a sudden now is like on the national team, or it might be a 60 year old golfer that was like a 15 handicap, but now he's competing for the club championship. What do you think is, is the thing that gets people to attain another level of golf? So I think that this is in a couple of sections. So for me, uh, I'd say the first thing is, really becoming excellent around the greens, um, putting the right systems in place around, around the greens. So you've got actually exceptional questioning processes that allows you to dial into what the exacting shot, the situation, the ground conditions, etc., are calling for. So I find that that's really, really, really vital for a player. What it, in fact it does, is it just gives them a much bigger toolbox to allow them to be much more creative and more versatile around the greens. And then I would say that for all the players that I've seen that grade up the quickest are the ones who end up getting screened early um, as part of their coaching process. And therefore they understand what they can and can't do. So therefore, what are the right components for their swing? So, Let's say they want, they're somebody who historically has been, a, let's say, a 15 handicap. They've had a little bit too much fade or right curvature on the golf ball. They want to start to be able to have more control of the ball. But therefore, what are they going to be the components that they're going to need that A, fit with their anatomy and with their desired ball flight? And I think that for me, understanding how their body is going to be predisposed to want to work alongside them, the, right, the correct components for the ball flight and matching the two together get the best out of it for the player so when you're talking about screened uh you mean like a golf golf physical like an, an assessment of their flexibility and their strength and things like that tell me tell me like what what does that look like to you is that like the typical tpi kind of thing or what, what do you like to do now i do it quite different to tpi so i'm quite fortunate i spent a bit of time around uh mark bull over here in the uk he's he's exceptional when it comes to um sort of i would say the anatomy within 3D. So um, I'd say probably, you know, obviously we've got biomechanics, as he is obviously a biomechanist, and he, I'd say that in his niche of understanding the human body, probably the best in the world at it. So I've spent quite a lot of time with Bully. I've got a few of the bits that he would look for. And I've also been over to the ETPI Centre, which is European, European Tour Performance Institute over at Terrible Ange in France, which is uh, JJ Rive. So I spent quite a lot of time with JJ. He has a completely different screening process there to is that, how... Um, is that place similar to the Altus place or is, this, is that a different place? Quite different, yeah. It's okay. A, it's, it's, it's actually really, it's quite a cool place to look for. I think, I think the resort itself has got voted the best golf resort in Europe. It's got um, a two Michelin star restaurant there. 36 hole golf course, probably one of the best ranges you've ever seen in your life. Wow. Um, JJ's facility is ridiculous. It's amazing. He uh, he's very involved with Under Armour in the design of the golf shoes from a performance perspective. Yeah. So I, what I've done is I've taken a couple of the tests from TPI, some of the ones that I think are very very valuable from that JJ does, a few bits of what Mark Ball does, and then a couple of others that I used to yeah, yeah, see used from just a physical perspective from uh, track and field because I used to compete track and field wise and then I basically morphed it all together to form my own one and then 
I used to, every single time a prep person would come in, I'd do a full screening before they'd come in, um, or as soon as they came in, should I say. Um, whereas now, there's about six tests that I'll do immediately. But, that, but what I like to do is I like to see what a, see what a player's doing from movement, what, what data they're going to produce from a ball flight perspective, and then go and screen something that stands out rather than... If I do a full screen, sometimes you can have a bias on the uh, information you're going to give to a player. So I know that there's two or three that I want to know to begin with that are going to help just analyse certain parts for me. And then I'll narrow it in further to the player um, as we go along. So it's really interesting to me um, when you talk about like having a process, like a questioning process, because you usually when people play golf, like there's not really a plan. It's more like you hit it and then it's like, I'll just decide when I get there, you know, really how I'm feeling. But you're, you're almost talking about like, okay, you hit a shot uh, around the green. Let's like consider like a par three, you hit a shot, you've missed the green and you're around the green. So now there's almost like a decision tree that you're going through kind of like they would do like if you called a call center for like a help with your, you know, a uh, laptop or something. So there's yeah. you, the decision tree might be like, okay, is the, is the lie good? Yes, it is good. So then it's like, choose your own adventures. Like, okay, because the lie is good, here are my options. And it's like, okay, where's the pin? Is, is that like kind of how the decision tree works? Yeah. Uh, in the I'm processing? actually going to put it up right here. This, the, the, exact, the exact route I go, a lot, I, I kind of been fine tuned a little bit as time's gone along. So obviously lie is going to dictate everything. So what I'd do is I'd have lie, then I'd go into ground conditions, which is very, particularly in the UK with the climate changing a lot um, at different times of the year, which really affect ground conditions. Okay. So whether yeah. it's soft, hard, etc., etc. Then I look at the grass, the direction it's lying, the into the grain, down grain, etc. Then we'll look at the flag location. Then from there, it's the slope. So is it above, below you? What have you got to work around? And then uh, what trajectory we think we're going to need to access the flag. Mm -hmm. Then it'll be the club delivery based off all of those things. And then you're looking how much the weather can impact it. So is it into the wind or how much will the wind affect it if there is much about. Then we're looking at landing spot. Then the club work we're going to choose to hit. Then we're going to green reading. So actually reading it properly. So we know what, what we're going to expect to find. And then from there, visualise it. And then finally, I'll all be put into particularly a player when they are practicing to help them with it, I'll have acceptance zones for them. So what would they, to certain spots, you, you might be in a terrible miss. So 15 foot is just get it to there and hopefully hold a putt. But there are others that you're saying, well, I'm actually going to try and hold this one or get it inside three feet and understand what the PGA Tour averages are within certain uh, sort of uh, distant areas and then building that into a player's uh, acceptance zone for when they are practicing. So therefore, they're always pushing themselves to be the best they can be. And then another thing, kind of like you were saying with your screening, uh, this is an important point, I would think, that you have to know your limitations as a, a golfer to know like, okay, the best shot here would be a flop shot, but you also know like, I stink at that. And my chances yeah. of hitting that good are low. So you might want to hit it differently. So how, how do you think somebody can objectively assess their own skill, especially when it comes to feel shots and all, all shots around the green? Because sometimes it's like, well, you don't see the forest for the trees. You're like, well, one time I hit this really great shot and you really remember that great shot you hit. And you, so you think you have it, even though maybe strokes gained wise, you're horrible at that shot. And, and it can go the other way too, because negativity really sticks on you even even more so you might actually be pretty good at a shot but you keep remembering the one time you sculled it like over the green so how do you how does somebody objectively assess their skills to know what shots they should be attempting so what i do is the, the one of the first things i do is actually with a player who's put together uh, some tests into their practice that will get them hitting all the different shots and we'll build into it landing zone testing uh, trajectory testing and then also build lies into it and then what we start to then look at is having a look at the testing to see what results it gives us will then tend to show there's a shortcoming somewhere 
if there is a technical deficiency in it, then obviously we look at that to try and level that up. But in the short term of playing golf, then let's say the player misses and they're going to ha- and they're faced with the you know, the perfect shot is the one that they're worst at. We will always then go well. There's always no matter where you are, even if you've got flop shot, there's probably always a second option. But the fact is, you're probably going to be left with 15 feet. Therefore, though, you're better off playing the averages and knocking it to 15 foot and trying to hold a putt rather than trying to play the Hollywood flop shot that you know if you pull it off, you might get it up and down. But you could flub it into the bunker in front of you. Then your emotions are going to get the better of you and you're going to turn the chance of only 15 foot per par. You're probably going to bring double or treble in. So I'd always, that's how I'd do it. And I'd very much base it around the, the testing at the start of a lesson. or the, And then I'd build that testing into someone's practice sessions and I always want them to record the tests so that therefore they can then see how much that's then starting to impact their stats on the golf course and you can start to align the two and really start to see um, how things are being affected or being affected one way or the other from a um, from a scoring perspective. Okay, let's get into the uh, some of the technical aspects of the swing, which you're really good at on your channel, and I think one of the main reasons, the draws that gets to people to your channel. If anybody is not subscribed to Dan Whitaker Golf on YouTube, do so now. Dan has a lot of really great videos, and I think he's picking up the production process more. You were, I think, like producing a ton of videos a couple years ago, and then um, it's been slower re- uh, in the last year or so. And then now, now you're, I, I can see you're starting to do it again. So kind of tell us about your plans going forward with uh, Dan Whitaker Golf on YouTube. Yeah, I, what happened was um, a couple of years ago, in there around just before COVID, I started to make some videos that just were not authentic to me, where my business is, where it's going. I really didn't like the way they were being produced, if I was honest with you. Um, and the content I was delivering, I ended up doing some awful videos, like fixture slides and certain things that just – with no way even close to being in line for me. And it was quite interesting. The titles like Fixture Slice, you'd expect to get loads of views on. I just got no, next to no views on. Yeah. Just because it just wasn't in line with what my audience was after. So all the videos like that I've since said, taken down off the channel. I don't want them on there because they're not in line with where I want to be going. Mm-hmm. So I think it took me a little while to just realize what do I want to get out of the videos um, in terms of for me? And what do I want to deliver for the viewer? And I want to make sure that everything is fully in line with where I'm going. So in terms of going forward, we've just done a really cool series on using hat motion. Um, but sort of, because it's quite easy with hat motion to actually go exceptionally sort of technical on it. So actually explaining the way that different risk configurations start to work, how it could all fit together for you as a player, what your pattern would be. So we've done a big series on that. That 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 should be going live, first video in about a week. So I'm excited for that. And then going forward, I want to do a few more videos with some more players um, and then really dial into just very much down the technical route, but also making some of the technical simplistic. So... Mm-hmm. You know, one of the things I believe is that my job is to understand everything in its complexity, to coach it in its simplicity. I want to make sure that the videos that I produce are fully in line with that as well. Awesome. Look forward to it. So um, I have some hack motion questions for you uh, later, too, because I, I have one and I use it a lot. But uh, something I want to ask you about. So it's like one of the main ways I can tell or that helps me understand kind of a coach's teaching philosophy is Dan, like if, um, so you, you make a backswing and because you make, when you make a backswing, your right arm bends, you're no longer on kind of the plane. The club was at address, you know, you're higher. And so, but then when you impact it, you're on an, a, kind of the functional swing plane, which is like from belt to belt, basically. So yeah. you've a uh, golfer's got to do something and there's different solutions to this, but a golfer does have to do something for, to get the hands on this kind of like uh, attack plane or this, uh, you know, where you're through the ball, where it becomes kind of semi planar, like down low. So what do you think, uh, given like, you know, somebody in reasonably good shape and flexibility, what do you think is your preferred way 
to get people back down to the impact plane? So when you first of all go back down to go back at the top of the backswing, I think one of the most important bits that a lot of people, and this is going against certain, certain coaches and certain things that you see, is that the right scapula has got to be exceptionally stable at the top of the backswing, mm-hmm. which I tend to see that, that then it influences where the right elbow is going to sit at the top. Um, and if, provided you've got enough flexibility, and pretty much everyone actually does, actually a lot of the stuff, I'm going to go around this in a different way, giving you the answer, but I'm going to get there, sure. um, goes back to address. And I see a lot of people sit the shoulders way too far forwards within the shoulder sockets, which therefore influences the way the right elbow can fold. So if the shoulders sit forwards in the socket, the right elbow is going to want to fold and work behind the player, so therefore gets a little bit high at the top, gets exceptionally unstable in the scapula. Normally, you see the shoulder moves in towards the right ear at the top and raises up a little bit. You start to see different uh, angles in the tilt. So do you mean that you would, you would like to see people, when they're at a dress, get the scapulas a little closer together rather than like more, that? More, so, or, more not, not quite that, more where the shoulder sits within its socket. So one of the tests I think that's slightly flawed from um, TPI right. is the, the, is the 90-90 test because they're not doing it from a golf position. Mm-hmm. Now, I actually haven't seen a player who's, got really, who's really poor at that when they stand to the golf ball correctly. So if you get the shoulders to actually sit further back within their socket, socket this way, so not forward, essentially bring them up to your ears, roll them back to the wall and sit them down. Now from here, you've got exceptional range. So where they sit um, at a dress from the shoulders and therefore where the elbow will sit relative to the rib cage mm-hmm. is going to heavily influence where the right elbow can fold and load and be at the top of the backswing. Okay. Now, the reason that, I, that that's so important is if you think about it, in that change of direction, um, which I'm sure we're going on to this based off the Brian Manzella sort of conversation from a few days ago yeah, sure. uh, that I've seen online, is that if that elbow starts to sit quite high here, the force down the hand pack generally forces the shaft to be steep. And then it sends to see the player has to back out of it a touch. That's where a lot of early extension can come from in order to shallow the shaft at the bottom. Whereas when the elbow sits down, that force down the hand path, actually you can get the hands to be pulling the shaft down towards the ball. Now, in terms of the arms lowering and what they need to do, I think that the coach's job is to understand the player that's in front of them. So I'll have certain players who will feel it through their arms and I'll coach them that way. So I'll have, I might say, use the analogy of, I want you to feel like you're pulling the grip off the shaft towards the golf ball, which is going to bring those arms back down in front of them. I'll get other people who will try and do it all through the pivot, where I'll be ensuring that we're getting that right hip to work downwards a little bit lower in transition because we know that that's a big thing that's got to happen. And I'll be getting them to lower the rib cage relative to the ball that will help the arms to want to fire down. Now, that's two completely different feeling ways to achieve the same thing. But I think that the coach's job is to understand what the, what the, uh, how the pupil is trying to see and feel the world around them to therefore give the information that's right for the player. Yeah, uh, yeah. Any kind of feel f- can make something completely opposite happen. But when, when, as far as like what should happen from not just like a feel point of view, but in a, like a real point of view, like, do you think the arms uh, not only need to go down, but do you think that um, th- like there should actually be muscular force in the arms to make them go down, or do you think that more happens from the body? Like, are the arms themselves pulling down? You always hear, like, Sergio say, like, you know, uh, I would ring a bell, or uh, Davis Tom says I would pound a stake into the ground. The Jim Flick uh, golf schools thing in the, in the 80s and the 90s was to go here and, they, you know, drop the arms three times and then drop them the third time and swing through. You know, like, how, how, important, how important do you think is the actual pull of the arms down to that plane before you, you go? I would be much more on what the pivot's doing. I'd be, yeah. I'd be getting the pivot to do the work and uh, 
only coach the arms if the player was leaving the arms behind them too long in the downswing. Mm. I'd be trying to do everything with the pivot. Okay, okay. So that's always – so then if I'm up here – because uh, I've interviewed so many coaches on both sides. If I'm up here and I, and I just tell someone rotate, you know, with no other directions, which is what a lot of people hear. They just hear like rotation, so important. And they're here and you just think rotation in and of itself, the hands go this way. So that's yeah. why a lot of people will say, okay, the rotation has to be blended with, a, with an aggressive hands down. Uh, a la, that, like what Justin Rose did like six years ago. I think that when you look at look at the actual true top of the backswing, for, uh, and then you go into that counter rotation phase, which is obviously the transition. Mm -hmm. So re reality is the first bit that we're, I'm trying to do is create a bit of a lateral move in that transition. And and if you think about the top of the backswing, the distal relationship, uh, the greatest distal relationship is from the outside of the left foot to the little uh, finger of the left hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, they're never going to be further apart than they are at the top of the backswing. Now, if we can actually create a force along that line, so a lateral force moving across with the hands staying up there, a split moment, we're increasing torque. There's going to be more speed in that because we're going to get more of a stretch phase. So I'd be that that would be I wouldn't be wanting the arm to come down too quickly. I'd be actually encouraging to get a little bit of you know a little extra bit of stretch force. A little bit of strict along that distal relationship, mm -hmm. with the but with the caveat that the diaphragm has got to be moving to the left. So therefore, that creates that extra little bit of stretch. Then the then as everything starts to catch up, that starts to bring the arms back down with it. So you're saying a crucial part of getting the hands uh, to not work this way, but to work, um, you know, down closer to the impact plane is that the uh is to have the hips reverse the direction before the upper body does yeah i, I would be and i wouldn't I, I wouldn't be wanting the pelvis to rotate too quickly i'd be wanting to get a little bit more lateral across oh, okay. i wanted to make sure that the right side of the pelvis lowers a little bit when we've seen the best players and you have a look at some of the best, the strongest hitters and you look at 3d data mm -hmm. that right side of the pelvis goes a little bit lower my issue with a lot of the guys is that when they start teaching rotation on the way down, the left side of the pelvis stays very low and the right side gets high. Then all of a sudden, you've got a lot of back out to try and shallow it. So therefore, they've got to pull the arms down to in order to shallow it. But actually, if you think about it, if you create a lateral motion, the right ankle starts to bank in with a little bit. The uh, right hip starts to get lower a little bit. Therefore, the right side of the rib cage, right shoulder starts to work down with the touch that's shallow in the club for you but mm -hmm. at the same time the sternum is down at the ground now for me you've got the perfect combo you've got the club shallowing with the arms in front i don't think you can have a better position than that yeah how important in this process is um thoracic bends uh, as far as like the rib cage going this way a lot of people are saying that's a big part of getting the club to attack from the inside Whereas if the uh, front, the distance between your armpit and your belt buckle stays the same, it goes this way. But it, if you increase flexion in your waist and you bend this way, it helps you attack it from the inside. Or do you think you don't really? That's not a huge component of the shallowing. I see that the right side bend is, is definitely going to be a component of it. But I, I, I see a lot of coaches getting the, as getting how the pelvis moves in transition wrong in terms of the way that yeah. that right hip's got to work. Yeah, because I've heard a lot from coaches that in transition, the pointer of the left hip goes down as uh, the hip. So like, uh, so if these were my hips, right, it would be here, yeah. and this is the left pointer. So yeah. it'd be here, and it would go, oh, sorry, face on view. So it would go here, and then it'd go down as it goes, sits back. So it's like you're sitting on a chair, but you're putting this down. And then the right side gets bent, and then you come around. But you, th you think that's, that's wrong, how the pelvis moves that, like that? Well, you've got to put some compensations in, haven't you? If, you, if that's happening, okay, short, the right shoulder cannot naturally lower, can it? Because if that right left side goes down, the right side of the pelvis has got to go up. Yeah, yeah, Therefore, it, it's an inelastic thing, the hips, yeah. 
So therefore, what will the right shoulder do? Probably go up. So therefore, you've then got to increase a lot more right side bend on the way down, probably drop the arms behind you. I'm not saying it can't be done, there's just a lot of compensations to it. So it doesn't, so it's not a natural flow of the pivot. You put extra bits in to compensate for it. Now, mm -hmm. the player who maybe is doing that is to say, I'm going to get the stern and back on top of the golf ball, and that's how we're going to get it there. I think you can do it by just increasing forward bend. Okay. And, but, but, doesn't, but doesn't keeping the left hip high usually go with the hips then sliding off sides too much and then not rotating? I see more players who don't get the, uh, don't get the lateral correct in transition. I see more players who have done what you said there, keep the left hip low. So therefore, when they've moved across, oh, okay. they've actually started to rotate. Because if the left hip stays low, the right hip's going to go out. It's going to go forwards a little bit. It's going to have a bit of rotation. And then they end up going lateral late, which therefore slides the knee out too far. Therefore, they can't use the verticals gotcha. to impact. Okay, so, so, you so get the lateral, you can start to get the pattern better. So you're saying if you don't go lateral, if you don't go lateral in transition and you start going down, you're going to feel, you're probably going to feel steep. So then you'll have to go lateral late to still try to hit it from the inside. Okay. 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, how is this different than like, um, you can't really see me, but uh, it, when you take a backswing and then kind of leave your, your tailbone at the target and you go like that, that some people were talking about a while ago, you leave your hips and, and you go like, uh, Scott, uh, Chuck Evans called it the butt crack drill, or you take your butt and you go towards the target like that. And then you get this uh, kind of uh, this, this look at the target before yeah, exactly you go down. What you mean. Yeah. yeah. What has that, what you're saying different than that? Because well, you're you when you're adding uh, forward bend, you're re-squaring a little bit, right? Yeah. Okay. But also, I'm, but, if, but if you remember what I said right at the top in the initial transition, the first thing that I'm making sure that as it moves across is that the diaphragm moves. Because the diaphragm is where true separation in the human body is going to come from. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's going okay, to be way better than the pelvis. It's going to be much better for longevity as a human. It doesn't have any injuries associated to it. The diaphragm has got to move alongside that slide when that lateral is coming in. That's going to move with it, where oh, okay. the arms will stay up for a split moment. We're not talking loads of linear here, but a little bit of linear from that. And then from there, I'm also it will be going forwards very slightly. We're not talking ridiculous amounts here. But for me, that becomes the perfect combination. You've got a good shallow shaft with the arms in front. Mm -hmm. Therefore, for the player, a lot of space and the club's still delivering from a shallow angle. Okay, something I want to ask you about, like the, probably the most popular series of videos we did on Beaver Golf, or the second most popular series of videos we did on Beaver Golf, was talking to different coaches about what, what they do uh, to address kind of like a flip impact. And you kind of got into it a little bit there with the diaphragm. But um, so just if somebody is seeing through impact that they're not getting it like uh, a functionally flat left wrist or whatever it is, but they're they're not leaning the shaft forward at impact. And then with driver, it's just like with the good players, the shaft is up and down, but it's like the hands are forward in their thing. They're not like drifted like like this, you know. So what do you usually do to to help a player get um, a better impact as far as like hands forward in impact or you know a uh, like lag tension and impact, some people call it. What, what do you uh, do to help people with that? So in terms of impact, I, the big issue I see when people are throwing it away is that they just haven't um, functionally been able to move the right side fully through the golf ball together. They'll often have kept that right shoulder too far back. So that could be linked back to transition or a concept issue or the fact that they're shallow and they're called exceptionally late. But if the shoulder, right shoulder stays too far back, the the compression of the golf ball or more appropriately the pressure from the right palm against the shaft cannot be down at the ground because the right shoulder's further back you're further away from the ball so you've got to extend the right hand so therefore that's going to create the flip so if you start to be able to get the right shoulder more mm -hmm. in line with the ball on top of it whatever you want to call it but a more to target side at impact therefore the leverage can be maintained and therefore, the body is going to start to open up a lot more. The 
handle is going to start to want to go a little bit more left. Lots of great things from a compression perspective are going to come in from there. Um, and I see that that's pretty easy to do when you've got the correct sequencing. Yeah, it's so interesting you say that because how, how it ties together. Because I think one of the main reasons people don't get this right side forward is because they'll swing over, the, if they do it their way, they'll swing over the top of it if they do this. So yeah. they do this to hit towards what we call first base, you know, like that. And then this never gets forward. So uh, I know you answered this already, but best part for somebody seeing themselves kind of slide, stall, tilt, and flip through it. What's, the, what's some of your kind of go-to to drills, especially if you're not working with somebody directly, to get people to be more open and forward, kind of like a, almost like a Darren Clark, you know, how forward he would get through with the upper body. Yeah. What's some of your get, favorite ways? I'd, I'd, I'd really start to look at, uh, beginning with it, just some half swings to give them the feeling. Mm -hmm. And what I'd look, I'd look to do is I would, uh, I'd ask them to get, get into a follow through, a half follow through. And I'd want uh, the pacing of the right elbow the right shoulder, the right hip, the right knee, and the club to have all come through together. Mm -hmm. So therefore, their reference point is that whole side has come through together. Therefore, the leverage is going to be maintained in the right wrist. So we'd really start to look at how that can happen. Then from there, I also actually start to, sometimes I'll hold a club in just the left hand, just to help the player will, and I'll get them to swing their right side and try and get the feeling of the right side going past the left hand. Imagine they're hitting a wall. I'd even do it against a wall occasionally. So the hand's going to go in there, but the right shoulder's got to be forwards enough to deliver a flat palm against a flat surface on this side of the player. Whereas if the shoulder is back, they're only going to hit it with the fingertips because they can't get palm there. Oh, I got you. I got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, let me ask you uh, some hack mo motion questions because I'm always trying to get smarter with that uh okay so one thing i wanted to ask you and i know there's different patterns but for, as far as your preference so if i have this right and hopefully you can see that yeah okay good it might be backwards but this would be top this would be the address this would be the top and then this is it diving down towards oh, come on clear up yeah there you go so do you like to see um f and that's a flexion extension graph so do you like to see, uh, like, uh, I think maybe Tommy Fleetwood is this pattern, I'm not sure. But do you like to see this getting ever more flexed all the way to impact? Or do you like to see this getting flexed and then like at about like P5.5, then starting to, to go towards extension through impact? So do you like to see it like dive bombing all the way to impact like that? Or do you like to see then it spike like at the very end, start to on the up. I think okay, so it depends on what the player, how the player interacts with the club. He's going to start with grip, how they grip it, how they hold it, how the wrists are going to be predisposed to move, etc. But I would say that from my experiences, actually hold, having it holding it, getting it flexing, and keeping it flexed all the way through impact, and keeping it going this way, even going further. If if they can, is not good advice. I mean, I've, I've got uh, uh, one of my players, uh, you know, he's won a few times on the European tour and he had surgery and his wrist pattern pre-surgery was that it would increase flexion through impact. Mm -hmm. okay? And basically, there's a subsheath around the tendon, around the wrist and he, he tore the subsheath. So, it was... He, he, he damaged his wrist? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, without... Naming names, I know one player that, that does this move as they go through. It's so hard when I'm not. But they, they you know, do this roll and snap kind of thing. Yeah. Same yeah. thing. They, they caught a root doing that. And they were, um, they've been, they were on the tour. Now they're off the tour for like two years uh, dealing with the same kind of thing. It's just yeah. hard. It, it, when you do that, you think it's just hard to accept that this is kind of a compromised position. It's like hard to accept a force that way, you think? It was quite interesting. When a player's like that, you can guarantee that they've got a lot of leg drive through the golf ball. Okay. Okay, they mm -hmm. probably need some extension from the left side, filling more verticals from the ground uh, to match the wrist conditions up to everything else that they're trying to achieve. Um, so that idea of flexing further or staying in as much flexion as possible at impact, 
I don't. I would not advise that for any player. Is not that also when you try to add that flexion through impact? Is that also a speed killer as well? You know, because you're not yeah. really letting it go. Like, okay. Yeah, most definitely. Mm-hmm. So, some you know, what are be a great player in the wind and exceptionally good at flight in the golf ball mm-hmm. from a perspective of being a great player, but they probably have some limiting factors of what they're able to do. Okay. Okay. So what are, um, you were talking a little bit about how you like to use the hack motion with, um, in a bit different of a way to match feeling real with like what the wrists are doing. So kind of clue us into how you're using it. Yeah. So obviously depending on how the, how they are interacting with the, the grip. So, you know, whether it's a bit weaker, medium, strong, that's something that will play into what we'd start to see through the graphs. Um, I don't really have a preference to a graph. Okay, I'm very much more down the, you know, what is the matchup for the player? Mm-hmm. I've heard people talk about, you know, if you've got somebody who's got quite a lot of lag, uh, then actually you probably want to take a little bit out of it because it limits them in other areas of the game. I disagree with that. So I think that what you, you, you should be doing is, that if you've got somebody who is, you know, they're seeing the radial go up quite a lot in that transition and then therefore they're getting quite a lot of down cock, if you like, on the club. As long as they've got flexion going at the, at the same rate as, as they're creating the lag, if you want, I'm, I'm cool with it. Because therefore I can then extend their left side through the golf ball a lot more to match the release profile up to where the golf club was going to be the, a halfway down. So it's all about matching the components together for me for a player rather than this is what I, exactly what I'd look for in one player. I just, you know, I remember listening to one of Scott's presentations, which in my opinion were fantastic. Um, but he talked about a lag profile of a player and talked about, you know, almost preferring it if they could take a bit of that out. And I've, I, I've, had, I've got some really, really talented players who've gone on to achieve really good things who I've never done that to. Um, and it's just then understanding that, okay, they've got other areas of their game that I just need to now make sure that I give them the right tool to allow them to be mm-hmm. exceptional in those other areas. So final risk question for you, because uh, I've worked with a few students and other people with the hack motion, and, I, and I'm seeing a lot of times they get the humps correct as far as the motion of the, how the wrist goes correct, but uh, the timing is very difficult to change. Like it, almost always I see people, they're at the top, they do whatever they do at the top and then they extend and then they do this. Whereas like, you know, the good players are doing this just before, just during the transition. So almost everybody's like that I've seen with it on, it goes this way uh, towards extension before it's a little too late and then they, they, they do that to shallow it late. So how do you get, and then whenever you tell them like, oh no, you need to do that early, they do, they, their timing remains exactly the same. They just make the graph bigger in the exact same time, you know? So what, what do you think is a good way to get people to uh, John Sinclair, a good risk guy that I really like, always says that, you know, whether you're Shane Lowry or you're uh, John Rom, you should be going this way in transition, seeking towards more uh, flexion in the left wrist. So yeah. what do you think is a good way to change that timing for people? Start to get the feeling of it from three quarters of the way back in the backswing. Mm-hmm. Change the intent from three quarters of the way back. That's yeah. been my experience of seeing the change happen. Like the, the, sh- like the uh, shot shape intent? So, so, like, so let's say their intent of the wrist, it'd be, it'll still remain pretty much the same at the top. They'll still be in extension. They might be slightly less extended. But their feeling is from three quarters of the way back is that they're trying to flatten that wrist out from there which actually then starts to bring it into the correct profile in that transition. Whereas the transition is such a finite period of time, then actually just trying to change it there, you've got to add, from my experiences, if you put the intent for the change earlier on, you actually then get it at that later time when they're after it. And I'd also then caveat that with ensuring that you've got the correct stretch phase in that transition to allow the wrists to take part of it all. Because if you've got somebody who it naturally extends the wrist and then flattens it and you're working at trying to change it, but they're feeling it all in the arm, oh, there's yeah, a yeah. chance that if you've actually re-stretched them, that they'll start to see that the change of direction of the body starts to influence the mass of the golf club, which influences the wrists. 
So for me, the, the risk data is really, really, really good. I absolutely love it. But I'll often work away from the problem to fix the problem. Sure, yeah. Yeah, because if you try to do it all in here, it's it might that night might not be the issue. Yeah, probably exactly. not the issue. Yeah. Okay, Dan, this is great. Uh, thank you so much. If anybody wants to see more about Dan, the first thing to do definitely is go subscribe to his YouTube channel, Dan Whitaker Golf. It's uh, it's linked in the description of this video, and uh, subscribe to Dan. Uh, tell us what else you have going on and coming up, Dan. So yeah, we're just going to be starting to get into the season over here in Europe and the UK. So. Um, got a few of the guys uh, starting to get out um, on the various tours, so that's going to be cool. Um, we've got a little bit of um, probably got a couple of coaching trips coming up overseas, which should be good fun. And um, I think it's going to be a pretty full on year with traveling to events and cool. obviously uh, everybody local. And uh, to me, wants to suddenly either already in pre-season mode or suddenly you know you get lots of messages and i realize the season's up coming up quick i want to get in uh so i feel like it's gonna be quite a busy year and that with social media stuff i'm i'm excited for this year all right everybody and so follow dan on instagram as well if you just search what's your instagram dan uh d whitaker golf d whitaker golf or or here on youtube also uh subscribe to this channel uh, we have a lot of really cool stuff coming up. I just did a long series with Dr. Scott Lynn yesterday, and you guys will see that coming out and a bunch of other stuff. Thanks for watching.